The F-16 Fighting Falcon is a lightweight, multi-role fighter that is highly maneuverable in air-to-air -air combat and air-to-ground attack. Designed as a high-performance, cost-effective combat weapon, it's in use by 25 nations around the world. Don't let its small size fool you. The F-16 employs advanced aerospace engineering and flight control systems and can withstand over 9 Gs, more than any other current fighter. I'm Paul Max Moga, and I've flown some of the most sophisticated planes ever built. I'm at Langley Air Force Base in Hampton, Virginia, the first U.S. military base built specifically for air power. On this episode of Great Plains, we'll learn the amazing story of the F-16 Fighting Falcon. Lieutenant Colonel Bob Ghost Gray flew the F-16 here in Virginia. Well, Ghost, I appreciate you taking a couple minutes to talk to us about the F-16 today. Tell me a little bit about what you know about the history of this jet as far as why did the Air Force need the plane in the first place? Max, the F-16 was a response to the cost and complexity of the F-15. So they came up with the lightweight fighter concept. And uh, what resulted from that was the F-16. The goal was lightweight, low cost, minimal complexity uh, airplane that they could put a lot up of rather than a few uh, very complex and uh, capable airplanes. The F-16 entered service in 1979, packing Mach 2 speed, agility, and high-tech features into a lightweight fuselage. Equally incredible is that the creation of the F-16 utilizes a new design process that hasn't been used on a fighter before. It represents the latest technology available to military aviation anywhere. It can handle almost any kind of mission with more comfort and ease than any other fighter. Many see the F-16 as the ultimate dogfighter, a culmination of 60 years of fighter development. When World War II reunites enemy nations, they quickly learn that the opposition's fighters are faster, more heavily armored, and have deadly effect. The need for a superior aircraft is fueled by the ongoing conflict. Several nations in the conflict experiment with jet power, and by the end of the war, the Allies and Germans are building the first fighter jets. Nazi leaders recognize the importance of air power, and their financial contributions generate several breakthroughs in jet research. German designers are the first to raise the issue of compressibility, the drag and control problems encountered at high speed. Nazi engineers experiment with swept back wing designs to reduce drag. The first U.S. jet takes flight in 1942. The Bell 59 Aero Comet is built around the Whittle turbojet, but its performance is inferior to other fighters and production is canceled by 1944. Output of early engines is low and requires at least two power plants to achieve reasonable performance. While jet engine development radically progresses, many of the first fighter jets fail because the conventional airframe cannot equip a turbojet engine. 
The Republic F-84 is introduced with the same straight wings and tail of a World War II fighter, and several early flight tests result in fatal crashes. The jet has so many structural and engine problems that in the first year of service, the Air Force considers scrubbing the program. In spite of complications, studies continue and perseverance pays off when a possible solution comes from the North American Aviation Company. After studying information captured from the Germans at the end of the war, they proposed that swept back wings may decrease drag on a plane traveling at high speeds. The U.S. Army Air Corps ends a 40-year association with the Army and becomes the U.S. Air Force in 1947. The new Air Force focuses on jet research during this new era of aviation, where air power is a major element of defense and a primary hope for deterring war. Their tests confirm that the swept back wing surface adds speed without reducing the aircraft's stability and America's first swept-wing fighter, the F-86 Sabre, emerges for combat in 1950. The Sabre distinguishes itself in the Korean War as an excellent aircraft with high-speed maneuverability and firepower. But America is not the only country developing the swept back wing design. The Russians have also been using German innovation to manufacture their own jets with swept back wings. The most famous is the MiG-15. It shocks the West out of its complacency once it first appears over Korea in 1949. On June 27, 1950, the U.S. Air Force deploys to fight as an individual arm of the military for the first time. While the F-86 Sabre cannot match the MiG-15 in some performance areas, Sabre pilots use superior flight tactics to achieve a 10 to 1 kill ratio over MiGs in Korean dogfights. The U.S. finds success with this combination of experience and technology, but when the conflict ends in 1953, it seems that the time for the dogfighter is about to run out. During the Cold War, the role of American fighter aircraft is to destroy long-range Russian bombers that threaten nuclear attack. The Sabre's machine guns are not the best weapons to use against these aircraft and are soon replaced by missiles developed for air-to-air -air and air-to-ground use. As their sophistication improves, the fighter's role diminishes to a platform for launching missiles. In 1965, the United States commits air power to the Vietnam conflict. While fighter bombers are effective in the ground attack role, they are not dogfighters. When the North Vietnamese MiGs appear, the faster and more sophisticated American fighter bombers are not agile enough to bring them down. The MiG-21's maneuverability and speed make it one of the most widely used fighters in the world. The model is only a slight improvement to the MiG-15's use in the Korean War, but the agile fighters are heavily armed and more dangerous than ever. The Vietnam skies present another challenge with a change in the rules of engagement. This requires U.S. pilots to closely identify their target before weapon release. The previous tactics of long-range missile attack are useless, and pilots must develop new strategies. While developing high-speed missile platforms, a truly versatile aircraft evolves. The McDonnell F-4 Phantom revolutionizes aerial combat with its sophisticated radar and deadly air-to-air -air missiles. But the F-4 is never a true dogfighter, and the combination of Mach 2 speed and maneuverability is only a temporary answer to the deadly MiG. The Navy soon finds a replacement that revives the concept of a dual-role attack fighter.
On November 22, 1961, the F-4 Phantom breaks the world speed record, flying at 1,606 miles per hour. In the late 1960s, the United States Navy and Air Force worked to fill the void created by the lack of a high agility dogfighter. The Navy announces a design contest among manufacturers for a new plane to replace the F-4 Phantom. In 1969, they adopt the Grumman Corporation's sophisticated but expensive approach and develop an aircraft that can successfully perform two different types of missions. The Grumman F-14 Tomcat is a twin-engine aircraft with variable swept wings that adjust to suit the type of mission it is required to perform. With the wings swept back in a Delta configuration, it can reach 1,585 miles per hour and climb at 50,000 feet per minute. With the wings set forward, it can achieve greater agility and despite its considerable size, outmaneuver much smaller aircraft. This versatile jet can still fulfill the important Cold War role as an aircraft that launches long-range guided missiles that are highly accurate. The Air Force, however, has a less diverse mission requirement and looks toward the fixed wing design that McDonnell Douglas offers in the F-15 Eagle. The F-15 Eagle embodies knowledge from Vietnam air combat to create a fast and agile fighter. This single-seat, high-performance fighter is without a doubt the best dedicated dogfighter in service. But while the Eagle excels in the skies, cost makes it virtually impossible to equip every Air Force squadron. The U.S. military needs an economical, high-performance fighter that can be built in sufficient numbers to compete with the Soviet threat. and military top brass are not alone in recognizing this need. After serving in the Korean War, fighter tactics instructor Colonel John Boyd launches his own research to develop the necessary fighter. Colonel Boyd flew at the U.S. Air Force Weapons School at Nellis Air Force Base and became well known for defeating all challengers in air-to-air -air combat in 40 seconds or less. He gained further respect with the U.S. Air Force when he developed the aerial attack study which turned the art of dogfighting into a science. Colonel Boyd works with mathematician Thomas Christie to develop the now famous energy maneuverability theory. This groundbreaking work enables fighter pilots to evaluate their energy potential at any altitude and in any maneuver, as well as the energy potential of their aerial adversary. Colonel Boyd goes on to show how his theory can be used as an effective tool for designing new fighter aircraft. The approach emphasizes an aircraft capable of quick changes in speed, altitude, and direction. Boyd and a group of like-minded innovators form a small advocacy group within the U.S. Air Force, dubbed the Lightweight Fighter Mafia. They conceived the Lightweight Fighter Program, and in 1969, they secure funding from the Air Force to validate their theory. General Dynamics receives $149,000 and Northrop $100,000 to develop design concepts that embody Boyd's energy maneuverability theory for a small, low-drag, lightweight, pure fighter. The concept gains political support from the Deputy Secretary of Defense. In May 1971, he establishes an Air Force prototype study group, which will fund two of the proposals. And on the 6th of June 1972, the U.S. Defense Department seeks submissions from the aviation industry. Five companies respond, 
And in March, the air staff announces that the winners for the prototype development and testing phase are Northrop and General Dynamics. Northrop works in collaboration with McDonnell Douglas to design a twin-engine lightweight fighter that employs two separate tail fins, giving it an appearance similar to the F-15. The design is given the Air Force prefix YF-17, and they place an order for two prototypes. The General Dynamics concept employs a single engine design of the same type used in the twin engine F-15. Many late Western designs offer two power plants as a safeguard against engine failure, but General Dynamics wages a lot on the excellent reputation of the Pratt & Whitney F-100 engine. The Pratt & Whitney F-100 turbofan delivers 23,450 pounds of thrust and reduces the weight of the aircraft by 3,740 pounds. The model is designated the YF-16 and two prototypes are ordered. Both companies are given contracts of over $30 million to produce the competing models. In January 1974, General Dynamics delivers the first YF-16 to Edwards Air Force Base in California, and the first official flight is to commence on February 2nd. But the first actual flight occurs accidentally during a high-speed taxi test on January 21st. While gathering speed, a fin scrapes the ground and the aircraft begins to veer off the runway. The test pilot lifts off to avoid wrecking the machine and safely lands it six minutes later. Northrop completes the YF-17 design in June 1974, and after testing, competes in a flyover alongside the YF-16 as part of the decision-making process to resolve which concept will win. Belgium, Denmark, Norway, and the Netherlands form the Multinational Fighter Program Group to select a replacement for their aging F-104 starfighters. They indicate that the winner of the lightweight fighter contest will be the favored candidate. In September, the Air Force announces that they plan to purchase 650 of whichever aircraft is chosen for the air combat fighter. In January, the Air Force announces the selection of the YF-16. It is the overall performance of the F-16 prototypes that impressed the Department of Defense. A pre-production order of 15 aircraft is placed, with the prospect to purchase 650 aircraft over the next five years. But Northrop's design is not scrapped forever. The YF-17 would eventually evolve into the F-A-18 Hornet. The Hornet is an all-weather, carrier-capable, multi-role fighter jet designed to attack both ground and air targets. F-16s joined the Iraq War in 2003 and are still active in counterinsurgency missions. The Fighting Falcon's most famous involvement in the war was the 2006 strike that assassinated Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the then leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq. The U.S. Air Force names General Dynamics prototype, the YF-16, winner of the Air Combat Fighter Competition in January 1975. The flight test program reveals the YF-16's superior acceleration, climb rates, endurance, and turning ability. During development, both manufacturers are aware that the aging F-104 Starfighter will soon need to be replaced. The F-104 equips several European NATO air forces, so the replacement will be the fighter deal of the century. In May 1975, the prototype makes its first transatlantic flight for a sales tour to potential NATO customers. The Paris Air Show offers an ideal opportunity to display the YF-16's ability to European clients. At the Air Show, General Dynamics Chief Test Pilot Neil Anderson thrills the crowd and impresses experts with the red, white, and blue lightweight fighter. Many countries have been studying the design for some time. They are looking for a replacement European fighter that offers economy without sacrificing performance.
After intense international competition among manufacturers, NATO countries adopt that General Dynamics design. By the end of the air show, four European Air Forces sign up for 348 F-16s. With substantial orders on hand, General Dynamics Fort Worth plant goes into top gear, and the first F-16 single-seat model rolls out in December 1976 for testing. When the plane is built, it represents the last word in technological design. At about 18,000 pounds, the aircraft is extremely lightweight, thanks to the use of advanced aluminum alloys. The cockpit has several features not seen in earlier fighters. Provisions are made to reduce stress forces on pilots as their F-16s maneuver. Sharp turns and sudden accelerations can put the pilot's body under severe stress from the forces of gravity, or G-forces. Higher G-forces cause problems with blood circulation and present a serious threat to the pilot. At two Gs, the pilot begins to lose peripheral vision, and by six, he's in danger of blacking out. To improve the pilot's tolerance of G-forces, the seat is laid back at an angle of 30 degrees. This distributes the pilot's weight over a greater area and creates pressure for blood to return to the heart. The cockpit layout makes information readily available to enhance the pilot's situational awareness. The heads-up display, or HUD, projects visual flight and combat information onto the weapon sight glass directly in front of the pilot without obstructing his view. The design also places controls at the pilot's fingertips, so during a fight, he never needs to look down into the cockpit. For easy and accurate control of the aircraft during high-G combat maneuvers, the side stick controller is used instead of the conventional center-mounted stick. So talk to me a little bit about the evolution of the flight control system in the jet, specifically the stick. When it first came out as a new concept, did the guys that were flying it like it, or, or was it kind of foreign to them? Well, it was truly foreign. It was a side stick, which was different from any airplane before, the F-15 or the uh, F-4. And the stick didn't have any uh, movement at all in it. It was fixed. It uh, took inputs based on pressure alone. No movement. No movement, and the pilots didn't like that. Did that end up making it easier to fly, more difficult to fly? Did it, did it lighten the workload for the guy in the cockpit? It. it was a lot more sensitive control and you get into what they call roll ratcheting where you, you put what used to have been the right amount of input into a lateral move of the jet but you would give too much and you would overcorrect and it took a little bit coming from a different background to recalibrate your your uh, flying motor to what was the right input but once you got used to it it was great it was very responsive uh, as a fly-by-wire flight control system. The F-16 also employs an advanced radar for search, weapons control, and guidance. General Dynamics recognizes that maximum visibility can provide a small edge that today's dogfighters need over their opponents. The one-piece bubble canopy is one of the most subtle yet beneficial features of the F-16 design. It provides 360-degree all-around visibility. The wing and fuselage blend into each other, creating a single modular unit. By having a smooth transition from wing to fuselage, the F-16 is given improved performance at high angles of attack. The phenomenal maneuverability and agility that allows the F-16 pilot to outperform all other aircraft is a result of the blending of two new sciences. Fly-by-wire electrical operation of the aircraft's control surface actuators and a relaxed static stability. When both of these innovations work together with the F-16 electronics and automatic flight controls, the result puts the aircraft in a class of its own. The high-tech F-16 also uses a digital flight control concept. The flight control computer accepts the pilot's input from the stick and rudder controls and manipulates the control services to produce the desired result without inducing a loss of control. 
They had a certain advancements already by the time the F-16 was fielded, and one of them was the digital flight control concept. The F-16 was the first one to, to uh, have that kind of system. The airplane was able to be designed uh, what's called uh, statically unstable, so that it won't fly unless it has the assistance of a computer. So a computer actually controls all the flight control surfaces on that, sending signals to the hydraulics that move those surfaces, uh, which is a direct uh, contrast to how all previous airplanes were done. The F-16 is the first plane completely controlled by a computer, and many pilots call it the electric plane. It is also the first aircraft to feature a thrust to weight ratio greater than one to one, providing enough power to climb and accelerate vertically at the same time. Quick turnaround speed is essential for any modern day fighter. Its ability to land, quickly refuel and rearm is fundamental to its effectiveness in combat. Because the manufacturers incorporate technologies that are already proven in aircraft like the F-15 and F-111, it allows designers to simplify the airplane and reduce its size, purchase price, maintenance costs, and weight. The aviation industries of the four participating European nations also benefit from the F-16's success through subcontracting, licensing, and ultimate assembly. The first and major assembly line is at General Dynamics plant in Fort Worth, Texas. The program is large and complex. Scale models must be used to achieve effective workflow. As production and assembly get underway, the European manufacturers also begin construction. In August 1978, the first fully operational F-16 rolls off the line and begins pre-acceptance trials. And on January 23, 1979, the United States Air Force's 388th Tactical Fighter Wing at Hill Air Force Base in Utah receives the first F-16. Hill Air Force Base holds the official naming ceremony for the new aircraft on July 21, 1980. And the F-16 is formally named the Fighting Falcon, after the mascot for the United States Air Force Academy. Within weeks, other NATO Air Forces receive their own planes. Increased interest in the F-16 spawns orders from around the world. In 1979, Iran orders 160 aircraft. But after a change in power, the United States cancels the order. Eventually, 79 aircraft from that order find their way to the Israeli Air Force. The F-16 quickly becomes the standard fighter for countries who do not produce their own aircraft. Before Fighting Falcon was selected as the official name, pilots at Hill Air Force Base came up with a number of proposals, including Viper, because they thought it resembled a Cobra or Viper as it approached. Even though the Fighting Falcon became the official name, Viper stuck around and became the unofficial nickname for the F-16. The U.S. government selects the General Dynamics YF-16 after an intense competition between Northrop's YF-17 for a new lightweight fighter. By now, the F-16 is becoming the standard airframe for countries who do not produce their own aircraft. But these countries demand more than just a fighter. In 1979, the F-16 enters service as a representation of the latest technology, excelling in both dogfighting and ground attacks. Mindful of the dogfight mission, it is equipped with a cannon, missiles, and has a staggering array of potential configurations. The F-16 is armed with an M61 Vulcan 20mm cannon in the left wing route, and up to six AIM-9 Sidewinder heat-seeking short-range air-to-air missiles. It was conceived of as a, a lightweight, low-cost fighter, primarily for air-to-air, -air, but it evolved to possess uh, air-to-air and air-to-ground, a true multi-role fighter. 
It can do the air-to-air -air roll. Uh, it can do air-to-ground and dropping bombs, shooting missiles at the ground, and also do what's called a seed, suppression of enemy air defense, and that's where it's going against uh, an enemy SAM and shooting missiles at that SAM. It also carries a wide variety of air-to-ground missiles, rockets, or bombs, electronic countermeasures, navigation targeting or weapons pods, and fuel tanks on 11 hard points under the wings and fuselage. In addition to its traditional fighter role, pilots soon realize that the F-16 is highly effective in air-to-ground scenarios. So as a guy that flew it, you obviously liked it. Oh yeah. I liked the F-16. It was a great airplane to fly, but I really liked uh, the diversity of missions that it had. It gave me a lot of opportunity to train and fly in both an air-to-air -air and an air-to-ground role, and I liked so it. If you had to take your pick between the Viper and the Eagle, which one would you choose? That's always a loaded question. I love both of them. The Come Eagle, on, pick one. The Eagle was my first airplane. I loved it, and it was the big dog, the Cadillac of air-to-air -air warfare. And uh, the Viper, uh, I just love the fact that I could go out there and not only do an air-to-air -air mission, but air-to-ground. Uh, I probably, just based on mission alone, would take the uh, Viper, but they're both great. Bite your tongue. Yeah. Yeah, a good answer. In an air combat role, the F-16's maneuverability and combat radius exceed that of all potential threat fighter aircraft. In an air-to-ground role, it can fly more than 500 miles to deliver its weapons with superior accuracy and defend itself against enemy aircraft. So it's not surprising when the F-16 is chosen to participate in the 1981 technical bombing competition at Lossiemouth in Scotland. Considered by some to be the penultimate competition of its kind, the competition focuses on the ground attack capabilities of two types of aircraft from the British and two from the U.S. Still new and fairly unknown, the F-16 must compete against contenders with proven performance records. The BAC Jaguar is Britain's state-of-the-art ground attack aircraft. Another contender is General Dynamics F-111 Swing Wing Bomber, which comes from the same stable as the F-16. At the time, the F-111 is the Air Force's number one attack aircraft, capable of striking any fixed or moving target with a range of over 1,000 nautical miles. Employed by the Royal Air Force, the British twin-engine Buccaneer is a veteran with many years of service as a naval attack bomber. The F-16 wins the accuracy competition, even against the dedicated ground attack Jaguar. But the competition does not just test bombing accuracy. It involves all aspects of combat readiness and effectiveness. Navigation, aircraft turnaround, pilot skills, and tactics. In all aspects, the F-16 establishes itself with breathtaking effectiveness. By the time the final results are calculated, General Dynamics' brilliant lightweight wins the number one position in the final formation. However, the success of the F-16 at Lossiemouth does not come as a complete surprise. About a week before the competition, the Israeli Air Force demonstrates the F-16's bombing potential during Operation Babylon. This is the F-16's first combat mission worldwide. On the afternoon of June 7, 1981, Israeli fighter planes prepare for a surprise airstrike that will deprive the Iraqis of atomic weapons. The target is a nuclear reactor in Osirak, Iraq, where nuclear fuel can be converted into plutonium for atom bombs. 
The mission calls for eight F-16s, each carrying two 2,000-pound bombs and six F-15s that serve as fighter escorts to protect the bomb-laden Falcons. One by one, the Falcons' bombs find their marks, and in less than two minutes, the plant is destroyed by 16 tons of TNT. The bombs penetrate the plutonium processing plant and cause the reactor to collapse. The success of the mission brings attention to the F-16's flawless maneuvering and fly-by-wire controls. And this is only the beginning of the Fighting Falcon's rise to glory. The F-16's first air-to-air -air combat success comes on April 28, 1981, when the Israeli Air Force shoots down a Syrian Mi-8 helicopter with cannon fire. Air forces around the world become aware of the F-16's success as a low-cost, multi-role fighter. While United States F-16s see little combat in their first years, several other nations facing conflict turn to the Falcon and it quickly proves successful. A year later, in 1982, Israeli F-16s demonstrate their fighter ability when Syria threatens Israel. Together with the Israeli Air Force Eagles and F-4s, they devastate Syrian fighters in classic dogfight situations. One-on-one, -on -one, Syrian MiGs are simply no match for Israeli F-16s. Due to its astounding maneuverability, the United States Air Force quickly finds another role for the versatile fighter. On April 2, 1983, the U.S. Air Force Aerial Demonstration Squadron flies its first public show with the F-16. The Thunderbirds were activated in 1953 to present aerial maneuvers that exhibit the capabilities of high-performance Air Force aircraft. During the Soviet-Afghan War, Pakistani Air Force F-16s shoot down Afghan and Soviet ground attack and transport aircraft, operating in Pakistani airspace between May 1986 and December 1988. During Operation Desert Storm, the F-16 is known as the workhorse of the war. It executes 25% of all strike sorties throughout the war. Averaging 300 to 400 a day, the Fighting Falcon is credited with flying 13,500 sorties, more than any other aircraft. In March of 1993, Lockheed buys General Dynamics and merges with another company to become Lockheed Martin. This new company continues to make the F-16s. When Desert Storm ends, United States Air Force F-16s begin patrolling the Iraqi no-fly zones. NATO F-16s see action during Bosnian peacekeeping operations in 1994 to 1995, flying ground attack missions and enforcing the no-fly zone over Bosnia. F-16s returned to Iraq in December 1998 as part of the Operation Desert Fox bombing campaign to degrade Iraq's ability to manufacture and use weapons of mass destruction. The fighter responds to modern conflict by employing the latest precision munitions and by providing effective suppression of enemy air defenses. United States Air Force F-16s currently operate in Iraq and Afghanistan. Since the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, F-16s have flown continuous all-weather operations that accomplish precision strike mission objectives. 
The F-16 provides more proven combat capability and affordability than any other multi-role fighter available in the world today. The F-16 evolves through four generations to become the most capable multi-role fighter available, building upon its legendary combat record of 72 victories and zero losses. Talk to me about a couple of those different evolutions the plane has been through. What are some of the things that they have continuously made better about this plane throughout its service history? Well, the F-16 started out as an A model, and then it evolved into a C model, and that was a big evolutionary change. One of the, uh, the early A models had a different radar. It had much less capable uh, air-to-ground avionics. It had a very good sight for dropping bombs, but you had to find your target and maneuver yourself in the position to drop those bombs. When the uh, C model came along, all those uh, next generation capabilities with uh, targeting pod that allowed laser guided targeting uh, and uh, uh, LGB weapons to be dropped, it allowed, uh, had a GPS navigation system which allowed it to uh, target with uh, GPS guided bombs. The most current evolution uh, of the capabilities came about with the C model. It also got a bigger motor because the jet started to get heavier as it started to take on all these capabilities. It suffice to say that the Viper that first came out back in the late 70s would almost pale in comparison to the Vipers that we're flying today. Oh, most certainly. Most certainly. I mean, they were, they were lighter uh, and they were a lot simpler uh, avionics-wise. There were a lot uh, more additions that were added to the capabilities, both internally and externally, on the uh, F-16. Lockheed Martin and the U.S. Air Force are committed to modification and sustainment of the worldwide F-16 fleet. Continuous technology enhancements, upgrades, and global sustainment allow the F-16 to perform as a comprehensive weapon system. These advanced technologies spawn from the aircraft's performance in combat operations by multiple nations. They combine feedback from the warfighter and incorporate it into the avionic systems and architecture of the F-16 to keep the aircraft relevant. The Falcon proves itself through years of continuous combat with the United States Air Force. In 2005, the 2,231st and last F-16 is built for the U.S. Air Force. The fighter continues to serve with the U.S. and 23 other nations as the world standard in multi-role fighters. Not since the P-51 Mustang or the F-86 Sabre has such a technologically advanced flying machine come in such a deceivingly small package. Flown by pilots of 25 allied nations around the world, or the U.S. Air Force at home and abroad, Fighting Falcon has proven itself in vigorous exercises and in actual combat to be probably the greatest single-engine combat fighter since the arrival of the jet. <laughs>